Welcome, willing workers, to another Sunday lesson, and uh, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. I hope you received today's email from Ruth regarding the prayer list. We've got a, a number of people uh, that are on our prayer list. I want to personally thank uh, Ruth for uh, putting uh, the family, the Fowler family, on the list. Uh, Aunt Glenna was a special aunt for me in my younger years. Uh, she had two sons that were, one was my age and the other was just a couple of years older. And uh, we spent uh, many summers together uh, at uh, Aunt Glenna's house under her uh, mothership, if you will. Uh, and uh, uh, she was a lot like my own mother. And Having lost my mother at 49 years of age, uh, Aunt Glenna lived to a, a ripe age, and certainly she was a godly woman, and God was kind to her in uh, the years that she lived. Also, just remember all these others that are on our list, and pray for them as you pray, uh, when you pray, I'll, I'll put it like Jesus puts it, when you pray include these in your prayers. Now for our lesson today, we are looking in the book of Luke. Uh, we've gotten to the point where Jesus has begun his ministry, and the title of our lesson today is called Rejected, and we'll be looking in chapter 4 of Luke at verses 16 to 30. Our theme as we go through the lesson will be this, Jesus' offer of salvation will be rejected by some, leading to judgment. Now, as we uh, have done in the past, I'm going to read our verses for today, and then I'll make some comments referring back to those verses. Chapter 4, verse 16, And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And he, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me, to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of Jesus and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came all over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers 
in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove Jesus out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill in, on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the hill. But passing through their midst, Jesus went away. Now, Jesus has had his time in the desert, in the wilderness, if you will, and it was a time of temptation and trial for him. But immediately after that, Jesus went through all of the surrounding country, which would have been Galilee, and he was teaching in the various synagogues and being glorified by all who heard him. Now, this episode today is a transition to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, and he has shown up at the synagogue here, and Luke tells us that the mission of Jesus is clearly revealed as the promised Messiah of Israel. Jesus was treated in the Nazareth synagogue just as a visiting rabbi would be treated. And as the custom of the day was, he was asked to give the sermon. Jesus stood to read the Old Testament text of the day. And again, that was a custom in the synagogue on the Sabbath. The prophet Isaiah was part of the reading and Jesus turned to the part in the scroll that we would identify as chapter 61. Now, back in those days, the scroll did not contain chapter numbers and verse numbers. And so you had to turn the scroll by opening it, unrolling it, if you will, to the part that you wanted to read. And since Jesus is God incarnate, he knew exactly where to turn. And so he did. Now, there are about 2,000 prophecies pointing to the coming of Messiah in the Old Testament. Uh, this particular one is important because it describes the mission of, and Isaiah describes him as the servant of God, that is the same as the Messiah. And he had identified the Messiah back in chapter 53 of Isaiah. And that identification was as the Savior of the people. Now, Jesus is to be their Lord and their conqueror who will bring salvation, judgment, and redemption of God from God's wrath. Jesus reads this verse, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, even the apostles in the New Testament all performed miracles. Many of them just what Jesus did, performed miracles. But these other men did not have a divine nature, uh, which Jesus had, a divine nature. The Bible makes it clear that these men performed the miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Now, the earthly ministry of Jesus began after Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. You recall that story where Jesus went down to the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. And after coming out of the water, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, came in the form of a dove and rested upon Jesus. That was the anointing of Jesus' earthly ministry at that time. 
Now, the name of Christ is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew word that means Messiah. And it literally means, in Hebrew, the anointed one. Jesus was anointed by the power of the sovereign God through God the Holy Spirit. Now, anointing was a common practice among earthly kings and even prophets of God, and it was an act of consecration, that is, being blessed of God for the office to which they were ascending. Now, Isaiah speaks of anointing the Messiah as being endowed with power from God Almighty. The Nazareth Synagogue sermon was Jesus' first showing of his anointing in the scriptures. The most powerful preacher who walked the face of the earth was Jesus of Nazareth. He had the full anointing <clears throat> promised to the Messiah. He was anointed to proclaim good news <coughs> to all who were poor in spirit, who are numbered among the brokenhearted, who are poverty-stricken spiritually. Financially wealthy people are just as spiritually impoverished as those who have no wealth. They all desperately need to hear the preaching of the gospel. When the Lord Jesus preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit <clears throat> worked in the hearts of people and it awakened their hearts of stone and turned them to hearts of flesh. Let me ask you, Seemingly silly question, but hear me. Do you know a doctor who can heal a broken heart? Is there any more painful condition to suffer and to go through than a broken heart? I went through a lot of cancer treatments in the last year, 2019 that is. My heart wasn't broken. And maybe your heart has been broken in the past and you know how difficult it is. And it is painful condition, emotionally, spiritually for many. Jesus came to console those who had a broken heart. Now this message at the Nazareth Synagogue was really the greatest epistle emancipation proclamation in the history of the world because Jesus came to proclaim liberty to not only those who were enslaved and in chains but also those who were held <coughs> captive by Satan in bondage to sin slaves to the power of evil that's the same today People are enslaved, captive to Satan, held in bondage to their sin, and enslaved by the powers of evil. Jesus came to set them free by proclaiming liberty to all of us who, by our human nature, are enslaved to the impulses of of our sinful nature. He proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, which we read about in the Old Testament. That was a time when all debts were canceled. That 50-year cycle in the history of Israel <clears throat> was a foreshadowing of the ultimate work of Messiah who would cancel the debts of everybody. After Jesus read the, the, that uh, 
after Jesus read the scripture, he rolled the scroll back up and gave it back to the attendant. And this is important. Jesus sat down. Now, back in that day, the custom was for the rabbi to sit to give his sermon. You stood to read the word of God. Some churches still practice that today where you are asked to stand if you're able for the reading of the word of God. And once that reading was complete, uh, you were uh, you were asked you could sit down, told you could sit down. Back in Jesus' day, it was kind of the opposite. The rabbi stood to read God's word, and when it came time for the sermon, the rabbi would take a seat, and all of the congregation would gather around on the floor, and in many cases, it was a dirt floor, gather around the chair or the bench that the rabbi sat on to hear the sermon. So if you can imagine that in your mind's eye, 2,000 years ago. And that's where we get the saying, sitting at the feet of a great teacher. Now, we don't do that in college nowadays. You know, professors stand up at a podium, usually in a large classroom, and the uh, people in the class are uh, seated, usually uh, in a theater-style seating if it's a you know, a large class like 100 or 200 people, and he is giving a lecture, and the students uh, really don't have an opportunity to ask a question. They're just to listen and take notes, and uh, that's, uh, that's more common today. But all eyes in the synagogue this day were fixed upon Jesus. These people knew Jesus. They watched Jesus grow up. And they had heard stories of his incredible ministry out in the other cities and towns of Galilee. They knew he did miracles and they, he healed people and that he spoke to multitudes of people throughout the land, but especially in Galilee. And now... Jesus is preaching in his hometown for the first time. Jesus gives the shortest sermon recorded by anyone in sacred scripture. I know some of us sometimes think that the sermon uh, goes too long. But let me tell you, if you lived back in the days of the pilgrims and the Puritans, it was not uncommon to spend the entire afternoon in church listening to uh, a sermon. Uh, based on just a few verses of scripture. Uh, and uh, for us to get a little itchy uh, when noontime comes because it's lunchtime, uh, I don't think is being fair to the pastor. And uh, uh, yet uh, that does happen. Jesus said to them at this time, he said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. And that was the usual end of the sermon uh, that the rabbi gave. Amen is how they pronounced it. Now, the Naz Nazarenes understood what Jesus was saying. After all these centuries, the anointed one of God had appeared on the scene. The people from his hometown were astonished. There was no more important judgment you will ever make than answering this question, who is Jesus? Now, I want you to sit there for a moment in your imagination on the floor of the synagogue in Nazareth. You have just heard Jesus make his statement, make his sermon, if you will. And you've just heard the word of God, and now you hear God's son saying that he is God. Now, what's going to be your response? Now, if we could take ourselves away from the present day and what we know, and we're sitting there 
not knowing that the Messiah has come. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. What would your reaction be? Oh, I knew that boy. I knew him when he was growing up. I knew that kid is helping his daddy in the carpenter shop. I saw him growing up. They would have a difficult time accepting what Jesus has said. And so, what was their response? It certainly wasn't this. We're so glad, Jesus, to know that you're the Messiah. No. We have a recording in Scripture here of at least one thing that was said. And it was said, I think, in a snide way. Is not this Jesus Joseph's son? Well, yes, he was Joseph's adopted son. And he was God's son. But they didn't know that. They didn't understand that. The people choked on the words of Jesus because they did not understand Jesus was the son of the living God. They all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words. But Jesus understood they wanted a sign just as signs had been given in the other cities and villages of Nazareth. They had heard the rumors of his miraculous works throughout Galilee. They wanted him, the Nazarenes wanted him to do miracles and show his power right there in his hometown. What did Jesus do? He said this, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in the hometown as well. Truly, Jesus says, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. The meaning here is a person may achieve great fame. He may have great respect. He may even be lauded throughout the land except in his own hometown. Jesus gave two examples of this uh, as he spoke. <clears throat> he spoke of Elijah. He said, there were a lot of widows in Israel during Elijah's day. And during that famine and no rain of three and a half years, what did Elijah do? He went to Sidon, to the widows Zarephath's house and there he sojourned with her and provided for her needs during that drought and famine. Elijah's miracle was not for an Israelite of whom there were a lot of widows in Israel at that time. Then Jesus said this, and there were a lot of lepers in Israel during Elisha's day. And he didn't cleanse any of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. What did Elisha do? He dealt with Naaman from Syria and had him wash in the muddy waters of the Jordan seven times, and Naaman was healed of his leprosy. Now, what Jesus is dealing with here is God's economy. Why should I come to Nazareth, Jesus says, and do miracles for you? You have not honored nor received me as the Messiah. The point here is in the Old Testament, Elijah didn't come to the widows in Israel. Elisha didn't help the lepers in Israel. 
So I'm not coming to the sinners here in Nazareth. Now, everybody in the synagogue erupted with wrath against Jesus at that point. They didn't just get angry and shout at him or walk out on him. They rose up and drove him out of the synagogue, out of the town toward the edge of the, of the cliff upon which the town had been built. They intended to throw Jesus down or over that cliff to kill him. Scripture tells us, but passing through their midst, he went away. Now, early in Jesus' earthly ministry, the response of the people of Nazareth to one of their own was an unqualified rejection. Isaiah 53.3 described Jesus as the sin bearer and the suffering servant of Israel. Listen to what 53.3 says. He, the Messiah, was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, listen to John 1, verses 10 and 11. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Now, allow me to use some illustrative license here and re or paraphrase these verses that I just read. He, Jesus, was in Nazareth, and Nazareth was made by Jesus. But Nazareth did not know Jesus. He came to his own Nazarenes, and his own Nazarenes did not receive him. Jesus made Israel. When he came to his own, Israel received him not. Yes, there's a few who did. But primarily as a nation, they did not receive him nor if you want to go to the the scripture usage exclusively it includes the whole world Jesus made the world Jesus came to the world but the world did not receive him that is as true today as it was true in Nazareth's day. The scriptures make it abundantly clear that with Jesus, there is no neutrality. Jesus said it himself, you are either with me or against me. There is no other choice to make. Those who are not with Jesus are against Jesus. If you are not Jesus' disciple, you are his enemy. In your natural born state, which is a sinful nature, the scriptures tell us that you are in a state of enmity with God. The natural sinful nature of man is at enmity with God. This means that God's Son is also your enemy. Only a supernatural work of God's grace can change the disposition of your heart from that of an antagonist or foe of God to one who is devoted in love and religious affection to God. Unless God, the Holy Spirit, regenerates your soul and changes the disposition of your heart, you will be hard-hearted and you will disavow 
Jesus Christ. To receive Jesus in biblical terms is to embrace Jesus. The language of the New Testament is one of embracing Jesus and what he teaches. When the Bible speaks of believing in Christ, it means welcoming Christ, receiving Christ, trusting Christ, embracing him with all of one's heart, all of the heart that we can muster to Jesus. We read in the prologue or the introduction of the book of John in chapter 1, we read these words. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word translated here, right, in the Greek is this word exousia, which can also be translated as power or authority. When you receive Christ, you put your faith in Christ. Because you have faith, you are justified before God. And as a consequence of that justification, you are also immediately adopted into the family of God. And you are no longer an enemy of God. God is your heavenly Father. And because you received the Lord Jesus Christ and embraced him, the Lord Jesus Christ covers you with his heavenly righteousness. Christ becomes your older brother, if you will. Christ is God's only begotten son. All others are adopted children of God. The only thing that changes our status ultimately from hell to heaven is receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing to do. We cannot earn heaven. We cannot give enough money, time, talent to get ourselves into heaven. We must receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now let's consider how our culture today responds to the law of Almighty God. Are the people in our country willing to embrace sexual chastity and purity? Or do we revolt body and soul against God's prohibiting uh, sexual sin? No, we live in a culture where many people constantly blaspheme God and his name or the name of Jesus Christ. Christ stands as the supreme obstacle to our sin. If you receive Christ, you have to recognize your sin and Ask for forgiveness of your sin. You have to fall on your face in repentance. You have to beg for the forgiveness of God for the way you have violated his law. We don't understand how terribly we have violated the law of God these days. And I think we've not understood that for many centuries. But the day comes for every person, every man, woman, child, where we will stand before the throne of God. And on that day, Jesus will be one of two people. He will be the prosecutor or he will be your defender. You will be judged and you will either be 
sentenced to hell or you will be welcomed into heaven and forgiven. Luke tells us this is how it started in Nazareth. And all of what happened in Nazareth was just a foretaste of what was waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem. Are you with Jesus? Or are you against Jesus? Do you reject Jesus? Or do you receive Jesus? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and how you have enlightened us in our lesson today. Father, I just pray that the words of this message will sink into our souls and our hearts and that if we need to get on our face before you, Father, so be it. We will do that. And Lord, we just pray that you will help us to understand the depth of the sin that we have had against you and your laws. Father, help us now to live our life for you each and every day in the coming week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.